there's a desktop. Okay. And it's using the right microphone. Okay. So uh, we got a few minutes before class starts up here. Um, I imagine people know the schedule. A couple projects due today. No class next week because of B-sides, um, which you should all go to instead, B-sides San Francisco. And um, just like this week, We'll be splitting up. I'll be doing B-sides while Liz takes the team to CCDC. We were victorious in the qualifiers, so we are going to the regionals in Southern California. Um, so that is the first uh, I've mentioned before. Our, the CCDC team is doing very well. Um, this is, I'm glad that, that Liz is the coach of this. She's doing a much better job than I did. I'm not very good at this kind of coaching. She's got it going. Now we're the first one here to the first community college to make it. So anyway, um, at least we're the only community college to make it this year, and I rather imagine we're the only one to make it ever. This, this particular contest is extremely difficult for community colleges to compete in. But anyway, um, so they'll be going down there, and uh, while you're doing that, I'll be doing a workshop at B-Sides on Android apps, and uh, I'm filling in today, which is good, because this is open source intelligence, something I like to talk about, and... Uh, Let's see, we got another minute or two. Let me see if there's anything worth mentioning in the news. Oh, well, let's see if we got any online people. We may not have any. Looks like we don't. All right, they may show up later. Um, I wonder if the link on the page is wrong for the online people. Uh-oh, uh, let me take a look. It might be referring to some other URL that points to one of Liz's machines. That is probably the case. Um, well, it just points to this weird thing. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a problem. I'll update it now in case anybody ever figures it out. Um, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, let's see. 124 is here. And the live stream is actually like the one from my other classes. So that would be like this one. Um, all right, let's put that on this page. I think right up at the top, God knows. Um, all right. Um, 2.23.19. All right. We'll see if that does anybody any good. All right. But uh, it may be that you are the only folks that are not participating in the contest. Anyway, I'll put that up there. Hopefully that either you ruined the page or I made it possible to find it more easily to live stream. Let's see. Which of those has happened? Aha, there we go. All right, and that goes to a Zoom link. All right, good. Okay, anyway, so maybe people can find us if they want to. So, all right, and uh, that I think will do. I'm gonna skip everything else and get down to the chapter here, which is fun stuff. So online, you can learn a lot about people. This is OS Int. I know Alan's talking about writing a course just in OS Int here, which would be fun. Um, it is a very exciting topic. Um, there is an issue of the fact that it's sort of illegal, um, which is true of a lot of the stuff here. Uh, and it is, you know, I used to try real hard to be 100% legal, and uh, I found out it's kind of impossible. Um, and in the real world, sort of like Donald Trump and every and college and every other business, you do what you can, and you constantly get accused of breaking the law, and you have to have lawyers defending you, and it's never 100% clear that what you're doing is legal. Um, so as in this, you're talking about OS Int, where you are learning about a company and you're learning about the stuff they do not want you to know online. And that, of course, irritates them and they will claim you've gone too far and it's illegal every now and then and that's just the cost of doing business. So you have to consider your risk profile. Um, private companies are often willing to take a lot of risk. Um, uh, there are example, there are companies that manufacture equipment that does hacking back. As soon as someone attacks your network, it automatically hacks them back. That is fantastically illegal, 
Almost everybody in the community says, you're out of your mind, don't do that. But there's a small group of people that think that's awesome and do it. And then there are cases like Google. When China hacked Google, Google just hacked them back and stole all their stuff and told everybody, here, Microsoft, we found your stuff, Adobe, everybody. And, and that was, and I talked to the Secret Service about that. And they said that was illegal. And we told Google not to do that, but we didn't prosecute them. And it is kind of the Wild West out there. Um, something I just found out recently, which I guess other people knew, is the, best, the shootout at the OK Corral was from the sheriff trying to impound their guns because they had gun controls in the Old West. You had to put your guns in, turn your guns into the sheriff when you entered town. And that was what prompted it all. But anyway, um, so, well, we'll concentrate this stuff. You have to, so since you cannot know exactly that you're 100% legal, you either get very timid and do almost nothing, or you accept some degree of risk and then you have to adjust it. And this is true like every other risk, like the risk of getting hacked, the risk of using weak passwords, the risk of using your phone, online banking, email, everything has some risk in it. So, Anyway, if you, now in an, an authorized pen test, of course, you are authorized by the company. And if somebody's running a bug bounty program, then you're authorized to inspect them. And then, of course, your risk, your legal risk is much smaller, although it's never zero. Um, as you, you know, if you're a contractor and you're building someone a new kitchen, you get them to sign a contract, but the risk is still not zero. They can decide to sue you later because they don't like what happens. Anyway, so... Um, uh, people often put all kinds of personal information online and company information online. I found a lot of it out there. Um, one thing I find enormously helpful is product help forums. People, if I find a misconfigured server, I can often find the chat of the administrator trying to get help to fix that server, often dumping complete information about the server. Um, there is, I think the fundamental problem here is one I've seen at many levels and lived through many times. People online think that nobody sees what they're doing. They think they're in a small little community of people with their interests and their skill level and that nobody else notices. People on Facebook think nobody's going to see anything. There's some kind of illusion. I think people feel like they're with their family when they're in an online chat room and they just don't pay attention to the fact that anybody else is here. People just confess to crimes and say, oh, the FBI isn't looking. And sometimes they aren't, but often they are. And the problem is it's all getting indexed and, and and recorded so even if they aren't looking today they might a couple of years later look through an archive and find it um weave who hacked at&t and dumped out all the imei numbers for all the iphones which were basically being used as authentication tokens at that time so it made everybody's phones open to hacking and their apps he could have tried to defend himself by claiming that he was like doing some kind of public service but in an unencrypted chat room he conspired with others saying, I want to hurt AT&T. I want to plan this to do as much harm as possible. That kind of undercuts that. And Donald Trump and his son are the king of this, confessing to a crime in a public medium before their lawyer gets to say anything. This is why some, Trump's the Russia scandal started about two years ago. One of the famous constitutional lawyers was asked, are you going to defend Trump? And he said, no, he won't shut up. He won't stop tweeting. Okay, thank you. He won't do what I tell him to, and he won't pay the bill. So Trump ended up with a lunatic for a lawyer because he couldn't get a real lawyer. Uh, he hired some guy off of Fox News that, um, that was famous for trying to get people to post the Ten Commandments in their classrooms, which might be something some people like to see, but it's certainly not uh, the qualification required to defend him where he is. But anyway, um, he's got a different threat profile, and I think his plan is correctly that the only thing that matters is to keep his supporters enthusiastic. And as long as enough people are cheering for him, nobody can't be prosecuted for anything. And I think that is absolutely true. The presidency protects him from almost all legal attacks and impeachment is a political process and cannot happen as long as he remains popular. So he is in fact, I think, doing the correct thing to just go and talk about how bad Hillary is in the wall and talk about racist stuff to get his supporters to cheer for him. That is probably his wisest legal move. Um, anyway, and that's, that's the way things go. You, you mitigate your risk. There are a bunch of people waiting in Elizabeth's room. Zoom. Um, yeah, so please, uh, please tell them, tell them to come. Good. 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 I was wondering if this would happen. I'm glad somebody found it and someone can tell them to come. Uh, yeah. Good. So hopefully more people are coming. Anyway, so, um, all right. 
So we'll probably have more of them coming in. Oh, good. Good luck for Dr. Update. Okay, good. Fair enough. Hopefully, good. So I don't have access to that Zoom, and, and this is uh, part of the chaos. Uh, you can expect more of this stuff to happen because Liz and I are splitting up even more to do. Uh, good. Thanks. Okay, sorry about the confusion. Um, it will, um, next week class is canceled and this will probably keep happening. The whole reason why we basically, this is what, um, why I'm really glad we have Elizabeth because the job of running all these cyber competitions makes this too big a job for one teacher. And so we're working together as much as possible um, to have a class and the competition teams and the competition teams because we didn't plan for this because I didn't think she'd win. But the team won, so now they're going to this. Maybe they'll win this and go to the finals wherever they are, on the East Coast somewhere. So, you know, uh, this is the cost of victory. All right. So, good. There's a link. Zoom. Um, all right. That's a link. What, to this? Well, that's a link in this chat to this. you got to put it in Elizabeth's chat to this if you can do it. Anyway, um, so... All right, looks like some people are finding it and so on. There will be a video for the people who can't find it uh, and we will just try to cope with the madness. All right, so if you get online, um, there's a lot of information you can find out from people's resumes and from job offers. And then there's sites like Netcraft. So let's play with Netcraft a bit. Um, you can start here. Okay. Um, Right, you can search here for things like ccsf.edu, and this will give you a certain degree of data mining. Now, what is this nonsense? Zero results. Did I spell it wrong? I just did it earlier. What's that site running? I have some other search. Okay, this one here. All right. What's that site running? This is one of the many ways to do this. Okay. So you have two domains, and I'll go to the Maine City College domain. Whoops, what is this nonsense? Oh, it's the report I wanted. Okay. There we are. And now we get a report of information about that domain. There we go. All right. And uh, so you can see how old the domain is. You can see the virus total report, which will tell you if there's malware on the domain or other things it doesn't like. You can see the hosting history. What server has been used in the past? And all the way back to the beginning, you can see SPF and DMARC records. Um, our students are currently unable to sign up for free Amazon accounts with the City College email, and we can't figure out why. And this is one clue. There is something wrong with our email text records. Although they appear to be, I think the fundamental problem is this college is using two email services, Gmail and Microsoft. And they have an SPF record to apply to both, as, but apparently that combination is baffling Amazon servers that try to decide if we're really authorized to send email. And it seems to be baffling this too, that doesn't find the SPF and DMARC. Those are uh, text records in DNS for email servers that help uh, automated processes decide if email is spam. You're supposed to have list in these records what exact domains are allowed to send mail for you. And if someone else tries to send mail with a from address from your domain, it'll know it's fake because of this but apparently ours are set up in a way that is not passing all the tests. Uh, then there's various web trackers on companies. Um, this is, I think you saw this earlier with uh, the uh, privacy extension in Firefox that shows you all the people tracking you on every page. You can see there's some people, some analytics links on our pages. I think I saw another chat message go by. Let me just see what that is. I've used fog imaging before. All right. Um, not sure what that is. All right. So, uh, all right. Then you've got, um, various people at trackers. Then you have the server side technology. You're using XML and SSL. And if people are using things like WordPress and so on, you'll find it here. We're using jQuery and Bootstrap, which are some of the many modern JavaScript based libraries. We could be using Node.js and all sorts of things. Uh, this is very common. Almost everybody's using gzip. If you remember the violent Python stuff, that was a problem. When you write your own uh, layer, uh, low-level socket connections and do HTTP requests, it's hard to read the content because it comes in gzip. And you have to stop accepting gzip to uh, be able to see it in raw text. Anyway, so that's a useful way to find out what kind of technologies are there. I also use an extension, which I may have turned off, but maybe I'll turn it on again. 
uh, my add-ons are here. And there is an extension called Wappalizer. I'll enable it. And if I go back to say ccsf.edu, uh, now I can look at Wappalizer, should tell me what this is. Uh, although maybe, all right, let me try quitting the browser and coming in, I got to bring it up again to see if I can get it to work. Firefox often makes you restart a browser for extensions to work. Um, and where is it? Here, Firefox. All right, I thought I started Firefox. Maybe it dies. Okay, there. So here's this, and where is Wappalizer? Huh, all right. Uh, maybe I can't use it for some reason. Okay, doesn't appear to be working. I'm not going to struggle with it anymore. Wappalizer gives you an automatic detection of Cloudflare uh, and all the other things like Drupal. And I used it a lot, but for some reason it's not working right now. Um, Netcraft showed that domain was used. Fogproject.org. Fog IO Mage. All right. Anyway, I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, but this is kind of funny. I mean, I've got a lot of tweets now from someone. I think he actually came to one of my talks. He sent me tweets that consist of a picture and like 10 names and five garbled abbreviations. I get like eight of these a day. Something to do with blockchain in Oakland, and I can't make any sense out of it at all. It says, uh, I, at first I thought it was automated spam. Now I think it's actually a real person. But anyway, it's, um, it is a, a common thing on the internet that people communicate in a way that doesn't actually convey information. Anyway, um, so it, that's the tough thing about the internet. You're sending something to someone and you do not understand what they're seeing at the other end. You imagine they have a certain context. That's why uh, something I ought to mention is whenever you're communicating something to people, like about vulnerabilities or students about a class, you have to be very, very, very nice because you do not know the state they're in. And if you're saying something they might not like to hear, be, remove all your emotion from it. It's hard to do. I've made this mistake plenty of times, but you have to be, you have, it works much better if you are super polite, super gentle, very humble. It's the best way to deal with things online because when you hit them, you don't know where they're at. And a good portion of them are frantic and upset and ready to go off on you. So you'll get a lot better luck if you're very careful with it. So let's try who is. Um, and uh, who is is the questionable repository. Now you can run who is just from a command line, but you can also run it from a bunch of websites that do it for you. So if you put in a domain like ccsf.edu here, then you get the, and you prove that you're not a robot for them, then you get this who is. And so nothing about the registrant is up here, but down here we have the who is information for City College. So it gives you a mailing address, a name of a person at the college, a name of another person at the college. Now this stuff is frequently not updated very well. For example, I know he, he retired about a year ago, but he's still here. Many people forget to update it for years. So all this information is no good, which is really bad because there's an attack, which the Syrian Electronic Army was big on. All they have to do is contact your registrar, send them an email or a phone call, claim to be from this place and say, I'm moving to another server. And the registrar typically has no way to reach you except this information. So if they call this phone number and it doesn't reach anybody, they'll often just believe whoever this person is who claims to be one of these people and move your domain to another site. This happened to the New York Times about eight years ago and a bunch of other major sites. There's a Syrian Electronic Army at that time was one 17-year-old loyal to Assad serving as his electronic army, and he was very good at doing this, and he hacked all kinds of major American websites to put up Syrian propaganda, um, and people began to wonder, what can I do about this? And what you can do about it is not visible on this one, but I think if we go to sandclass.info, you'll see it. Um, I'm not a robot. Okay, uh, let's see. Mine, I think, has some locks on it. And this site is not showing you the locks, but I think we'll see the little later sites. You can put locks on your domain to prevent this. There are four or five records that limit the transfer of your domain, and that will make it more difficult for your registrar to transfer your domain and more difficult for people to hack it. And I went and taught, told a bunch of people about that. I actually won a few hundred dollars of bug bounty. It was kind of funny. They, several sites had bug bounty, so I notified them they had this vulnerability, and I got nothing. And like two years later, one of them came back and said, hey, that's actually a pretty good tip, and they paid me some money. 
because it wasn't at all where they, this is what usually happens to me on bug bounties. People want to hear a certain thing that's fashionable right now. Like they want to hear something about the random numbers are not random. So you can predict a cookie and get in someone else's account. And I'll tell them like, you should really be using HTTPS. And they're like, what are you talking about? They won't pay you to understand you. And I told them this DNS stuff, it just got thrown in some bin. They dug it out years later and said, oh yeah, we should do that. It's anyway. Um, so here's the city caller's normal record. If you use um, Kitten War, you'll see privacy protections. A lot of people like, I think um, GoDaddy will try to convince you to pay for privacy protections. And this is what this does, kittenwar.com. I guess this is a highly controversial, dangerous domain because they've hidden themselves. You have this registrant stuff up here, which is uh, name.com. So that is the person they bought the domain from. You cannot put your own domain on the internet. You have to pay a domain registrar. You have to pay them a certain amount of dollars per year, like typically $8 a year or something to have a domain. Although it can be much more because it's an open market and a popular domain, like the most popular, do uh, you guys know what the most valuable domain on earth is? Any guesses? What's that? No, not at all. The most, the highest bid domain in the world. Yes. And what is it? It's sex.com. Sex.com is the most valuable domain on earth. Anyway, as you would imagine, you make the most money from that domain. Anyway, so um, you, in those domains, you pay millions of dollars for because people just bid for them on the open market. But most domains that aren't that important, you only pay like eight bucks a year for. And once you do, you can then turn on privacy. And now you'll see registry not available. Who is agent? This is where nobody can contact you directly. They go to your DNS domain protection services. That's, and I think GoDaddy will do this and charge an extra couple bucks a year for it. Anyway, um, all right. By the way, so this brings, this entire database is currently pretty controversial because the general data protection regulation that just took effect in Europe appears to outlaw this entire process. Because if you think about this, this has a bunch of real names and phone numbers published in an open directory available to everybody. And everybody's kind of forced to do it. And there was not a big statement when you signed up for a domain by signing up for a domain, you consent to have your real name and address and phone number published to the whole world forever. And the, um, because of that, many people said, uh, who is would go down and no longer be accessible at all. It still seems to be up. There was a huge argument saying that the people uh, will have to just make this unavailable. Maybe it's blocked in Europe. I'm not sure what came of that. There was a huge storm saying this was going to vanish at the start of this year when uh, European privacy law went into effect, but it still seems to be up. So I don't know what's happening there. I know there's a lot of such issues. Another one is European companies are not allowed to use American businesses at all. This is a huge issue, and this comes from uh, not the current level of xenophobia that we have with the Trump administration, but the xenophobia going all the way back. And this is, uh, I think, all the way back to Bill Clinton. Um, foreigners have no privacy in America ever since 9-11. There are laws saying if, we, if the government wants to look in your email or in your bank account or anything else, if you are not a U.S. citizen, they can just do it. They don't need a court order or anything. You enjoy no privacy at all. That is so we can catch all those scary foreign terrorists. And that means it is outrageously illegal for anyone doing banking in Europe to use any American service like Gmail or Yahoo or any American bank or any American chat service or any American website or company. All of them take their private data and expose it to a place where they have no protections at all, which completely violates European privacy regulations. Right? You have data, you are not allowed to just... Jordan Breeze. And so they passed a thing called Safe Harbor, which was a temporary provision for, for four or six years, giving special dispensation to European companies to use American websites in return for promising that American websites would make some effort to protect their privacy, which as far as I can tell, they totally did nothing about. And then it expired. And for a few months, it was technically illegal for them to use American services. And then they passed another one to give them another special dispensation, which is currently in effect. This is a huge problem. And there are people like the guy in charge of F-Secure, Mikko Haponen, gives a lot of talks. He wanted to start a European group of people to develop alternative services in Europe so you would not be so tempted to use American services. But that didn't seem to go anywhere. And the fact is, if you're in Europe, there is nobody that can offer you awesome free stuff like Google, Yahoo, Amazon. Everybody wants to use it, even though they're in Europe. And the pressure is so big that they just paper over the privacy violation and sort of give them special dispensation like in America. 
the our, our, after 9-11, our government wanted to know everything that everybody was doing, not just the foreigners. So since they couldn't get that through Congress, they just made a private deal with AT&T to copy everything on the internet and the phone network and give it to the government to spy on, which was completely illegal. And about 10 years later, when it came out that they had done this, Congress passed a special provision guaranteeing that AT&T would not be punished for that. So, and this is why I say, you know, I used to be, try to be 100% legal and then I kind of had to admit, nobody's 100% legal. There is really no such thing. Unless you hide in your room under the bed, everything you do has some legal risk. Somebody will say you had no right to do that. I used to take students war driving through the city. We just drive around with laptops and pick up all the wireless networks and decide if they were secure. And then one guy said, that's illegal. Google got sued for that. And I looked, well, they sort of did. Those little vans Google drives around are picking up wireless networks. And they did, in fact, get sued saying, if you pick up my unencrypted wireless signals, which I'm spraying out into the public area, you're violating my privacy. And they did not triumph in court. Google settled. But that was not considered to be completely outrageous. And at that point, what are you doing? Anyway, there's, that's the problem. If you have some risk, whatever you do, no matter how innocent, there is somebody that might be able to find some way to complain about it, and therefore you have some non-zero legal risk. Anyway, um, however, I don't recommend breaking the law willy-nilly, doing anything really rotten. Uh, be as careful as you can, but you do have to accept that there are legal risks in addition to other risks in everything you do. So the who is data is not verified by any way. When you sign up for domain, you can put in fake name, fake address, which is fine. Now, if you do that, of course, and someone tries to move your domain, there will be no way for you to prove who the authorized person is. So, so professional companies put in real names. But anyway, um, by the way, the who is Microsoft.com is kind of fun. Um, because the who is command line utility did not work by looking for the domain Microsoft.com. It worked by a simple grep type string match, finding anything that began with Microsoft.com. So you could define a domain called Microsoft.com.anotherdomain.com. And this is a subdomain of Enagura. And people figured this out, so they put all kinds of insults in here about Microsoft. Microsoft is a steaming people, and on, because you could, and if people would show up just if you do this. No real Microsoft traffic would go there because the real domain is over here on the right, but it fools who is, and it was a good place to put a joke. There's a lot of jokes on the internet like this. Um, in fact, when you start doing this kind of research, I found uh, one of the major hosting providers, I don't think it was GoDaddy, it might've been another. If you start doing this kind of research, you will find, if you see this, please contact who's apply to work here. Because this is how you research domains and they're trying to find the people that know this. Normal people don't know how to do this and it's a good place to put an ad. So um, so let's play with some DNS. This is the kind of stuff that eventually led me to start a DNS class here, which some of you have taken. So if you want to um, bring up my slides and shove them over here. All right, so let's do some digs. Dig is how you uh, use Unix or the Mac to resolve domains. So if I dig Sam's class of info, I get, uh, this is what dig does by default. It does a DNS resolution. It tells you up here what version of dig you got and what query, what flags you have. If you don't specify queries, specify flags, then it is um, recursion desired and recursion available. Recursion is what you normally want. This is, um, there are two ways to do DNS queries. Recursion is where you ask the resolver and you say, if you don't know, please go ask someone else and find out. I mean, this is the old joke about the army. There's only three answers to every question. Yes, sir, no, sir, and I don't know, but I'll find out, sir. And this, for example, is now you can turn off recursion and then you get what you get at City College. You go to someone asking for help and they say, that's not my department, get lost. Like, well, can you go find out? No, go ask someone else. Then you ask someone else, ask someone else, they send you back to the first person and around you go. That's non-recursion. Most of the time, you don't want that. You ask something like your router, which is your DNS provider. Your router doesn't know anything. All your router knows is who to ask. But from the viewpoint of your computer, you just ask your router, your router knows everything because it just searches until it finds it. And that's recursion. That's normally what you want. So it did one query and got two answers. One query is where's my domain. Two answers are because I have two IP addresses. Now, the big companies will have two IP addresses in case one goes down. I'm a small company. I'm using Cloudflare. Cloudflare has two copies of my web page. I really only have one server, but to outside observers, it looks like I have two, two servers. So now um, you can learn more. You can look, for example, for any. Now any is being deprecated, and I don't know if it still works. Um, yeah, now any obsoleted C draft op. So any, I think, no longer works. Um, 
Any used to be the cool way to find out everything in an open public record about a domain, but uh, people got tired of it and started blocking it. And they deprecated it a few years ago. Now Cloudflare or whoever I'm communicating with here will no longer handle any. I think this is a Cloudflare record, I'm not really sure. Anyway, so I can't use any anymore, but I can look for things one by one. For example, if I look for MX, I'll be looking for mail records. And I've set mine to Mailinator, which led Kirk on a merry chase. He thought there might be some way to actually like get mail that's being sent to Sam's class to info because I don't have any email. And I just sent it to Mailinator, which I don't know if there's any way to actually anyone receive that mail. There might be somebody mailing people at Sam's class that info and I have no idea what's happening to them. Real, I don't really have an exchange server or anything set up. If you do, you'd put it here. Um, but everybody needs a name server. You can't be on the web at all if there isn't somebody to record your DNS name. So I got well, I got that. Of course, I'm just using Cloudflare's name server. That's a service they provide for free. So they're actually my name server and they provide <coughs> duplicate name servers so that it stays up all the time. Um, you can find the start of authority. Every DNS name has to have a single server, which is the authoritative data about your domain. One server has to be the SOA and all the rest are copying data from that server. So if you make a new subdomain, you add a new server or web page or something to your domain, you put it on the SOA and all the other DNS servers will copy from that one. So mine is coco.ns.cloudflare.com. Um, all right. And of course, I'm on IPv4 and IPv6. And I'm surprised it didn't automatically tell me that. But if you use quad A, you'll see the IPv6 record. And I think you can add two together here, quad A plus A. Nope, okay, anyway, quad A gives you the IPv6 record. And because on, my server is IPv4 only, because it's a German posting company that's not really, doesn't really care about IPv6, and I chose them because they're cheap and very fast, and they gave me a ton of space and bandwidth for cheap, but I'm going through Cloudflare, which mirrors them, and they turn my HTTP to HTTPS, and they turn my IPv4 to IPv6, so outside people see all these advanced features, which I don't have which is what a lot of people do and what I highly recommend. So nobody's actually looking at my web server. You're just looking at copies of my stuff on Cloudflare. And, um, and it appears to be served with the latest cool technology too. So if you can only speak IPv6 because you're a modern cell phone or something, um, then you'd be there. Although I don't think they're ready to speak only IPv6. Anyway, that's, uh, yeah, it's one in one, also called Perfora. They're the largest uh, advertised cluster in the world. They're very fast and they had like a three year free trial of their business plan. And they said, cause I was using like city college free server for 15 megs and then the, the free server at like uh, GeoCities, which gives you 15 megs. And they said, why don't you upgrade to a real plan? We'll give you a three year free trial of 500 megs and unlimited bandwidth. And I said, see how nice that is? And I said, boy, this really is nice. And they said, our, our market analysts say that if we give this away for three years, those people will stay with us. That's what I did. They're not kidding. Boy, this is so much better than trying to fit everything in a tiny little free account. So uh, I did. After that, I'm happy to pay their 10 bucks a month or whatever it is to uh, continue to enjoy a real web hosting. Anyway, so here's uh, some of these records. There's also pointer records and text records, which are indicated. Pointer records are for canonical names. So let's try some of them. Um, if I dig pointer records, um, I think ccss.edu is a pointer record, at least it used to be. That's enough. No, I got no answer. Um, but I maybe ccsf.org. It used to really be a ccsf.org because um, we were not qualified to be an EDU. The original rules said only four-year colleges can be EDUs. So if community colleges cannot be EDUs, we were just orgs. But then ICANN, which is famous for being incompetent, corrupt, crazy, contradicting themselves. They've been sued by their own board of director members and everything like crazy. It's madness up there, like most things on the internet. They gave a community college an EDU. And after that, all the other community colleges said, hey, how come they get it and we don't? So instead of taking it away from them, they gave it to everybody, which is the kind of baffling, stupid stuff that ICANN does all the time, the company in charge of this. So anyway, now we are an EDU, and apparently the org isn't even a pointer. EDU used to be a pointer to org, but apparently it's not now. Anyway, um, you can also put up text records of any type you like. Um, and this is where you put extra things that people invented after the DNS system was designed, like those uh, records, SPF and such, to record for email. You can have additional information as much as you want on your website. We'll see some later. Now, the nice thing you can do is you can dig at a specific server. 
And so back when I used to use any, by the way, any is not a global thing. Some servers may still support any. Let's give it a shot. We already did if I dig any, sampsclass.info, and I go to the, to the city college default, whatever that is. Uh, this is going to this server, 172.16.2.252. That server won't let me use any. Let's see if anybody will. I can dig at Google, for example. If I go to Google, I get that answer too. It may be that Cloudflare at my main server has said, I'm not going to do it anymore. Let's try a open DNS. Okay, any is obsolete. That's probably Cloudflare doing it. So let's try somebody else like ietf.org. Okay, this one still supports any. This is the Integrate Engineering Task Force, which is, by the way, the group that writes these standards. So you would think they would be obeying the standards, and they typically have all the advanced stuff, like this is um, secure DNS. DNS sec, giving all these cryptographic keys to prove the records. Um, but they are still supporting any, which I appreciate. So if you give it any, they tell me a lot of information. And uh, all right, so there's, there's, some, there's the SPF record. That's what I was hoping to see. That's what it looks like. That's the standard protection framework with IPv4 ranges and IPv6 ranges of servers that are authorized to send mail. And so their mail from that domain will presumably not be bounced as spam by automated processes at the email handlers. Anyway, but, and now let's, we're going to do some things with specific records here pretty soon. Different servers have different amounts of records. So let's try DNS cache snooping. I made a record at my website called test620.samsplash.info. There's nothing there. I just pointed it to one of Google servers, but it is a resolvable domain name. So let's try to dig it with no recurse. Now I went onto an open list of open resolvers and I found somebody's open resolve. Somebody is offering free service or they were at one time on this server and it's just one server. So since they are, I can, I can do this and resolve that record, although it is test 620, not test 360. I think I put it there so that people following along won't foul up this demo. So if I do this, I get, okay, it looks like I got a lot of stuff, but notice I have one query and zero answers. All the rest of this stuff is just boilerplate. It's the name of the server it asked, uh, the authority, it doesn't tell me the answer. The answer is not there. So this is, um, I think I can get a better answer with plus short. Let's put it over here. I think you can put it anywhere. Yeah, the short answer is no, it found nothing. Because I put no recurse here, it asked this server, do you know where that is? And if you don't know, don't go hunting for it. Just tell me if you know. So now if I do a resolution without the no recurse, it will do a recursive resolution. So when this server finds out that it does not know where that domain is, it will go ask somebody else and find out. So it found out. Now that it found out, if I do no recurse, it's there. This is called cache snooping. When it, when it um, resolved this domain, it put it in the cache on the server. So, because usually people keep asking the same thing over and over again, Yahoo, Yahoo, Microsoft, Microsoft. It doesn't bother for asking the main server every time that comes in. It caches it for a period of time, which is often up to a whole day or even longer. And so you can look in the cache. And if you find something in the cache, that means somebody using that server has been there recently. Now, if I get rid of the short and get the whole record here, you can see the time on that record. And notice it's 81 seconds there. And if I do it again, it's 73 seconds. That's counting down. I set the time short on my server to make this demo easier. So it, that's the cache, 67 seconds. And then, you know, it's, it's just counting down. And when it hits zero, it will, it will throw away the cache record and have to ask my server for a fresh record. If you set the cache too small, your server gets more load because this happens more often. If you set your cache too high, then if you do move to another server, your customers lose contact with you for some period of time, waiting for their local caches to update. Anyway, that's called cache snooping, and it's a way to see if someone has been somewhere. And if you can use it for a lot of purposes, like you can identify if people are infected with malware by seeing if the malicious domain is cached. That means somebody at our company has been going to this domain and malware domains are typically long, horrible things that no one would go to by accident. So the presence of that domain means somebody's infected on your system and things like that. Yeah, that's cached on that 109 server, exactly. So somebody offered your DNS server, they made it available to the whole world and they've ended up on some list and I found them 
And you can ask any recursive resolver any question and it will find out. That's why your authoritative resolver should not be recursive. The one you make to serve your domain, because you shouldn't be using it for general purposes, you should just be looking into your domain. You should have two DNS servers at your company. One which is the authoritative serve for, for your domain, so that um, outside people looking for your servers can find the answer there. And the other one is for your customers, your, your, your employees to use to browse the web. That should be a public recursive one. And the reason you have two of them is because they're serving different purposes, they have different kinds of loads, and they have different security considerations. Your internal one, unfortunately, probably has a lot of private information on it because Microsoft never really understood DNS really. They actually advocated other protocols back in the early days before the internet was popular. So Microsoft implemented DNS in a very strange, clumsy way. So every time a domain joined computer boots up, it registers itself with the domain name of a local DNS server and then expects it to be there. So typically you have a DNS record of every computer at your company in your private DNS server. And you really don't want to publish that information to the world. So that should be a separate server. Apple did something similar. Apple does horrible things to DNS. They've been banned at some colleges that were a few years ago. Apple, app, both Apple and Microsoft use DNS in very strange, unfortunate ways that really don't cooperate with the global community very well. Because they both developed their own proprietary networking protocols or un, un, unpopular network protocols before the internet was established and continued to use them and imperfectly upgraded to DNS. Anyway, so you can go online and find lists of public resolvers. There's a lot of them out there. And once you've found them, you can then do tests. So um, here is the non-recursive query. Like I said, uh, this is one that uh, tells me if something is in the server. You've seen that one. Um, so now you can do a recursive query. And if you do a recursive query, you can watch the TTL countdown like we just did. So as time goes on, it will just count down. And you'll see um, how many seconds are left before this uh, thing will refresh. So here's Punchcat. Now I did this already with this online server you saw. I can try to resolve this domain and it's not there. Then I can do it recursive. And now if I look at, do repeat the previous one, non-recursive, it's there. It will be there for a period of time. But let's try that with OpenDNS. So if I go to OpenDNS, if I do the non-recursive resolution of this domain, OpenDNS is one of the ones I got memorized, 208.67. 222, 222 is one of their servers. Okay, they, um, so this, is, this will do a non-recursive resolution of my domain and it got an answer, but the answer is no answer. So let's make it short, I think it's plus short. Yeah, okay. Now, if I uh, do this a few times, of course, I'm gonna always find that it's not on those servers. Now you might think there's only, you only need to do it once, but that is not true. If I get rid of the no recurse, this is gonna put it in the cache at the OpenDNS server. So now I found it. So now if I do the non-recursive one, it should be there, but it's not. Why is it not there? If I just keep trying it, it is there, and then it's not there again. This is because the Open, OpenDNS is a big company. It's not really one server, it's a load balancer. One address is now serving it to a bunch of servers, looks like maybe eight or 10 servers. So I put it in one of the caches, but it's not in the other caches. And so if I put it in more of the caches by doing more non-recursive ones, if I do four more queries not, that are recursive, now if I try the non-recursive queries, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, now more of them have got it. So I'm talking to a cluster, and this is one of the many ways you can spot that. All right. Um, all right, that's the game of that. And uh, we watch the TTL countdown, and then there's zone transfers. Zone transfers are how you get the whole database, and the point of zone transfers is not for customers to use. The point of zone transfers is for DNS servers to use. If you have a server, and you have a backup server, and then you decide to have a lot of load, I need another server, you bring up a new server. Now you could go on this server and copy the zone files, move them over with a file transfer or something, but there's a protocol to do it automatically called zone transfer. You bring up a new server, you make it a slave, it automatically connects to the master and copies all the data over. This is not supposed to be used by normal clients. It's supposed to be used to synchronize zones. And this is why Microsoft used the same word for Active Directory. If you have a domain controller and you make another domain controller, it does what they call a zone transfer to copy all the information about the Active Directory from one server to the new Active Directory server. 
Anyway, um, so you can do this online. If there, now most people, this is considered a vulnerability. If you allow unauthorized zone transfers, and long ago, like 15 years ago, the Microsoft and open source DNS servers had zone transfers on by default to everybody because they thought nobody would notice, nobody would care. Like they turned, at that time, it was very common to turn on all sorts of advanced services thinking nobody would find them. Um, but now most people are aware of this. So there's one, one place we can go is zonetransfer.me. Zone it's something someone set up just for this reason. So if I dig for the SOA of zonetransfer.me, Okay, I find the Startup Authority server. This was set up by DigiNinja, a, a, a sort of hacker and trainer, who put this up for purposes of having demonstration because I've demonstrated it with live companies a few times before, and typically, as soon as you do, they find out and close it. This is a serious vulnerability. People, City College is vulnerable. The first time I taught 123, and I had two sections, and I taught it on like Wednesday, and when I came in on Saturday, it was already closed, even though I didn't tell them. I was gonna tell them later. I was gonna leave it open long enough to demonstrate it to both classes, but people, Freak out, this is a pretty big one. And you'll see why, okay, so now since it's, this is just resolves it and gives me the start of authority here. To do the zone transfer, I can use, there are various ways to do it, but the simplest one is host minus L. So it's host minus L, and you give it the name of the domain, which is zone transfer.me, and then you give it the name of the server. Now, in principle, any of the servers might have this data, but typically you attack the start of authority to get the authoritative transfer. So that will get all the data on that server. And there it is. And note, uh, so this is all the information it got, a zone transfer. And I actually expected to see quite a bit more. I think something might be being blocked by the city college service. But I guess that's all I'm seeing here too. Okay. Um, when we're going, so well, let me show you what's better. For some reason, I'm not seeing as much as I expect to here. So I'm going to use this online service. By the way, when I taught this class before, the University of Georgia was open, and I got 1,038 records. It's closed now. You know, people wise up. But there's an online service that does a nice job. Zone transfer online test. So let's give that a shot. Um, so 5J. All right, what's going on here? But it's just nonsense. Uh, I keep on, it keeps coming on when I don't want it to. This happens constantly in my Mac now. It's constantly turning on weird junk. It actually sent an email to someone I was not trying to send an email to um, because it's so smart. It like guesses what you want to send and I like hit a key or something. So 5J, I thought I saved it, but it looks like somehow I lost it. Apparently so. All right, let's get it off of here. Uh, Hackertarget.com zone transfer. Okay. Hackertarget.com slash zone dash transfer. All right, I'm gonna make another attempt to put it on the page. Um, so it should be there as 5J, that was my intention. Somehow I failed. Good. That works. All right, so it's there. So now we can do this test online. So let's try, say, ccsf.edu, for example. And it's going to try it, and it fail, 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 which is what you expect. Almost anybody, people won't fall for this nonsense anymore. Um, but this one, of course, will. So zone transfer me. It will work. And here's what you get. And the reason I like this one better is it shows you a lot of records. Here's a text record, which is semicolon LS. This is looking for command injection by DNS resolution. Here's one uh, with a, a uh, IPv6 address. Here's one with, um, there's one here with a SQL injection. Uh, yeah, down here, here's a SQL injection one. Here's a shell shock injection one. These are all there for various attacks, which is pretty good fun. You know, so you can, in case you have a server that resolves something, it does a dig and then puts it in another command, which can happen if you have sloppy programmers, then these kind of tricks will be useful to test them out. So here's another one. This is a cross-site scripting injection. Anyway, it's kind of good fun. That's what he's got up there. And all those records are available to anybody that does his own transfer. All right. 
this, by the way, is why my, my website shows up in some blacklists. I've got some similar things on my website, like, like demonstration Trojans and stuff, and people keep finding them and flagging me as hosting malware, which technically I am. And like I say, there's this, there's a problem with, uh, with keeping your nose clean. You can't really get much done without doing some stuff that will make some people decide you're a bad guy. Anyway, so um, then there's the fierce DNS scanner. Built in Kali, it will try a bunch of stuff. It'll try his own transfer, and then it will try um, a brute force, trying thousands, 2,280 tests, just trying common domains. So this is a good place to start for recon on a server, because you often find unexpected domains sitting around that are full of juicy things, like passwords, backups, all sorts of good things. Uh, that's important, a good thing to use in CTFs. Very common when you put up a CTF and you're scanning a website, they put like the flag in some file that you can find with one of these scanners. All right, so here it is on Zone Transfer Me. It tries it and says, whoa, it worked. Misconfigured DNS server found, and so it gives you all the information on that DNS server. All right. Um, then there's an uh, online service here that will test for a whole bunch of, of DNS health records. Let's see what that comes up with. I think chapter 5H hopefully exists. 5H exists. All right. Let's see if it's still up. These things do tend to go down and get filtered. All right. So I can put in a domain name like ccsf.edu and then run the tool. And it will now um, do a health check. And these things are just whatever some person thought was the right amount of tests for your domain. So. Um, here's the no, parent domain is edu. Uh, my name servers are listed. There's a glue record. That's not doesn't matter. That's a detail we talk about in the D you know, OI 86 class. Uh, every domain has a record hosting the SOA's IP at the root of DNS. This is actually a huge problem on the internet. The internet is not like the zip code system where the numbers are sweeped into locations. It's just fragmented all over the place. And that causes it to be fantastically inefficient to where the number of routes on routing servers is over uh, 200,000 now. And um, therefore, uh, there's a chicken and the egg issue that causes every domain to have to store a hard-coded IP address at the root at the dot, uh, dot .com or dot .edu level. Those so have to have a huge database there, which is expensive and irritating and comes from sort of a uh, misuse of DNS. Technically, you're not supposed to have the SOA in the same domain as your domain. Because if your startup authority is dns.ccsf.edu, then people that have never been to ccsf.edu can't find it. And they say, well, in order to find it, I have to ask dns.ccsf.edu, but I can't find it because I don't know where ccsf.edu is. You're supposed to put your startup authority in another domain for that purpose, but nobody does. So to resolve that, you have to put these glue records at the root. Anyway, um, here's the name servers we're using. Um, and they don't accept recursive queries. That's good, I mentioned that before. Your servers serving your domain internally to external agents should not be recursive. People shouldn't be using them to go to external places. Um, and on it goes. It's had a whole bunch of tests to see what might be wrong on your domain, and that's pretty good. All right, it thinks our refresh value is very high. So that means um, if we were to move our startup authority to another server, people might lose contact with us for a long period of time. This is okay if you don't plan to move very often, which I think is the case here. So anyway, that's a useful thing to learn about how people have implemented their domain. And I've got some cahoots. All right. And then uh, we got a little more of this chapter and then I'm gonna have to leave the online people because I'm gonna dump some undisclosed vulnerabilities and I can't be streaming that. So, uh, but we'll, we will cover the chapter for everybody, but the people who actually show up in the classroom get to see the confidential stuff. Here comes a, a chat message. Oh, yeah, not happy. Yeah, that is, that's, yeah, that's true. I'm finding a lot of new stuff. I've been showing it to various classes, um, and I found a bunch more since the last dump on Wednesday. Uh, there'll be another dump next Wednesday. It'll be the third week in a row doing this. This is probably just going to continue because I've got some new tools to find vulnerabilities and I'm finding them everywhere. So anyway, um, so this is information gathering part one. There we go. And we got sound and everything. Okay. And I should make this a little smaller and higher. And I should have one of these. All right. 
Actually, I think I have one here. Okay. All right. Just put it on the same file, I guess. This is net 124, 223, 19. Okay. I think I forgot to send the emails. Everything else gets pretty much forgotten when I find a new source of vulnerabilities to research. When I first learned about IP version 6, um, I was doing uh, the Hurricane Electric tests. And um, for a whole week, I didn't hear anything anybody said to me. It was like um, Charlie Brown's teacher, wah, 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 because it was very interesting setting up these IPv6 servers. It was far more interesting than everything else people tried to get me to care about. We need to fill out this form, we need to go to this meeting. I said, yeah, I don't need to do any of that. Forget it all. <laughs> All right, wait a few more seconds. I saw Headmaster on some of the slides, I don't know what it was. <laughs> All right, five more seconds. I think we've got everybody that's coming. Okay. So, how do you find out what technologies are powering a website? Netcraft, very useful. All right. How do you find email servers? Okay, MX, mail exchange. What switch performs cache snooping? No recurse means you have to tell me what's in your memory without asking anybody else. All right, what query do you normally use when you're browsing the web? Okay, use recursive queries or what you normally want. Find the answer even if you have to ask somebody else. Unfortunately, the blue one is not correct. None of it is encrypted. Everybody's using plain old unencrypted UDP-based DNS, exposing their everything they do to privacy invasions. This is ridiculous, and various protocols have been proposed to provide encrypted DNS, and the one that seems to be winning is DOE, DNS over HTTPS. That seems to be the only one that's getting any traction. There were some older, more mathematically perfect protocols like DNS Curve and DNS Crypt, but they never went anywhere. DOE seems to be becoming popular. So I would imagine within the next five years, your browsers and operating systems will all start using Doe by default. But it has not happened yet. Unless you install optional additional software, all of your DNS queries are still going in plain text everywhere, which is extremely useful if you want to secure a domain. If you're a network administrator and you want to find out who is doing what they shouldn't be doing, all you have to do is log the DNS request and it will tell you exactly who went where and when. It's amazing. If you want to catch people who are goofing off, playing games, going to porn sites. You can just you know, list right there of who did what from where. It's extremely handy for network administrators, completely insane for anyone who cares about privacy. Anyway. All right. So what record finds an IPv6 address? Okay. Quad A. All right. So the winners I've got here. Now I'm going to put them down at the bottom. There, M dot. I know who that is. What? I don't know who that is. Ranton looks like a real name. Aha! This I see a chat message. This may perhaps be the identity of what? It is. Okay, good. All right. I will put that here. Okay. All right. Good. So. Um, all right, it's 10, uh, but I guess we ought to take a 10-minute break. Let's pick up at 10.15.
then I'll carry on here because I've got some more stuff to do from the chapter, and then I've got some stuff which I will go offline for. So I'll pause the recording for 10 minutes. Imagine it does now. There was, in fact, a huge argument on the web when we moved from PHP 5 to PHP 7, and it broke a lot of websites. It's a very similar issue to Python 2 to Python 3. There's a lot of legacy code. There's a lot of programmers that like the old version, and when you go to the new version, a lot of people get disgruntled. Anyway. But let's take a look at the rest of this, and then we'll move to the uh, undisclosed stuff. So if you want to find email addresses, this is actually an enormous problem. Um, when the internet came out, people said, let's use email for everything. Then they wanted an email directory. There were several proposals and several versions of email directories for the internet out there where you just look up everybody's email address because nobody thought about spam. Then spam became outrageously popular where everybody is now hiding on the internet. They don't want anybody finding their email address. So now it's technically difficult to find someone's email address, but in practice, if they're at a company, it's still extremely easy. Many places like City College just publish everybody's email in a simple web page, and even if they don't, it's almost always very easy to guess because it's just like the first letter, their first name, and then their last name at company.com or something like that because they have to use some system and people don't want to go nuts. So in fact, email is not that hidden, so everybody gets tons of spam, and there's tons of spam filtering at every level, so you now often don't get your email. If it's not thrown in the Google spam filter, it's thrown in some city college spam filter or some spam filter at a provider on the way there. So I remember uh, Sophos, sort of strange company, makes an antivirus that had enormous problems and they posed a blog that, that has caused some serious scandals by saying foolish things. Uh, they gave me a free iPad. They chose me in a drawing and they sent me emails saying, you want a free iPad, and all the spam filters threw it away. And they sent me email after email. Then they finally said, why aren't you answering these emails? What's wrong with you? And I said, sure, sure, you sent me a free iPad. Sure you did, just mail it to me. And they really did. They sent me an iPad. I said, this is for real. I didn't believe it. Some, and, and so I gave it to a student. I said, this is awesome. Anyway, so, uh, and they wanted a picture. When they saw a picture of me, they didn't use it. They said, oh. I think they were hoping you were giving it to someone prettier. Anyway, so, um, but, but they were actually sending out emails saying you want a free iPad, which is like one of the top 10 emails, like something about Viagra, something about iPad, something about penis enlargement. This stuff just vanishes. <laughs> anyway, uh, so there's a thing called the Harvester, which will go out and try to find all the emails at a website. It's a colleague tool. You can run it here, and it will then just do all the searches, search on all the, the search engines for email addresses, and then try various sources. It will just pile them up, find all the things that look like email addresses. Um, this is, you can do it yourself by searching, but there are tools to make it easier. Uh, this is because this is typically your first step in a penetration test. A typical penetration test, you're trying to get into a company. They have thousands of employees. And what you're going to do is get in by spear phishing. This is how almost everybody does it, bad guys and good guys. You get a list of all the email addresses. You now send an email to all of them. You carefully craft it to get their attention. Come up with something that will get people emotional. Like at City College, it would be something about layoffs something about parking, something about traffic, something about like building safety, um, active shooter in cloud hall or something. Come up with something that will get people excited. Click on this link. Get them excited enough that they'll ignore any warnings that come up about that link. Oh my God, I have to find out about this right away. Like here's the list of all the teachers being fired because they're money. Somebody will click on that. This happened to RSA. RSA was the, uh, the RSA is basically the linchpin of security on the internet. They make the secure ID tokens that everybody uses in government and insurance companies and business at the biggest businesses. And they had a master key for all the tokens. And China wanted to hack them and steal the master key so they could get into Lockheed Martin and steal our military secrets. And what they did was they sent an email to everybody at RSA with a spreadsheet attached that had malware in it. And their email spam filter detected it and threw it in the trash. But it was so interesting that someone in RSA pulled it out of the trash and opened the spreadsheet to get infected. It's a social engineering. You have to make it interesting, and then somebody will open it, and their stuff won't be updated, or they'll ignore the warning, and then you're in. You, you, so after you send the spam email out with, with malware in it, you get a foothold into somebody's machine, probably some random low-level worker, but now you have a shell. Now you traverse through the network, find other machines, find other passwords, and crawl your way in. Yeah, what about it? Harvester, yeah, Harvester is a, a tool that then does web searches, yeah. So you went through all the Googles and then things to get the attention? Yeah, to hunt for email, yeah. It's just automating. Oh, well, it finds them. If you go to, in fact, let's try it. Actually, that's a good idea. Let's try doing it for City College. 
Um, I've got my server running, so let's see if the harvester is on here. I think it is. Um, let me uh, make this bigger. Let's see, shift control plus, there we go. So the harvester, yeah, I've got it. So it's the harvester dash D, ccsf.edu, dash B all. Let's see if that works. Okay, there it goes. Started harvesting, searching on Google. How do you think this will be Google? Well, we're going to find out. Um, trying all kinds of things, looking for PGP. PGP are those, is that encryption system, and you have to put these public keys on public servers, and they have to have an email address in them, so it's a place where people put emails, and they stay there forever. I've got like five or six, and like everybody else, I lost my key to take them down, so I can't take them down. So they just stay up there forever. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know how long. Well, we'll come back later and see how many it found. But it probably will find a ton because there are, is a real page on the City College website that lists emails. It should at least find that. And that should give it a few hundred. That could be. It depends on your company. But in fact, um, people do use emails and it ends up posted all over the place. Um, typically, it leaks out. Anyway, so um, all right. There's another trick, by the way, since you brought it up. There's two other tricks not in the slides that you should know about email. One I think a lot of you know is Mailinator. If you want to, if someone wants your email and you don't want them having it, you use this, like Sam CCSF. You can put a Sam CCSF at Mailinator.com, and it will go. Any mail you send will appear here. It's not secret. There's no password. Everybody can see it, and it's temporary. It only stays here for about two hours, and then they throw it away. These people want spam. They're researching the spam. And so you sign up for things, use this address, and you can get an email and click on the link. Just be aware, it's not secret. If you sign up for a service using this, anybody can get in here and change your password and stuff. But if you're just signing up for like a free offer and you know they're gonna send you spam, you send it here. So you just create a set uh, Yeah, anything you want. Yeah, you can make anything you want. If you choose any common word, it'll be all full of other people's stuff. But if you choose something kind of long put a few numbers in it it'll be basically private so it's not yeah anytime you need an email you can use this and it's an option um and that's one thing there's another email trick i wanted to tell you which i oh yeah other email trick is a google trick if you have a gmail account you can make more email addresses um so if you have a gmail account like you, you at gmail.com, you can put, um, I think it's this, you can put you dot one, two, three at gmail. I think it's this. I've heard, I haven't do this, but I've heard other people do this. You can put a dot in extra stuff and it will not, it will still come to you. So what people do is when they sign up for sites and they want to know who spammed them, they'll use a different version of their email address at every site. And then if somebody sends you spam, you know which site leaked it. Because all these go to you. Anyway, I don't know if that's true. I, I've heard that. People say that's all. I haven't tested it. But you can, you can customize your email at Gmail, and it won't matter. Anyway, so that's another email trick that people use a lot. A lot of people get very excited about spam, and they spend a lot of effort in trying to track down who's spamming them and stuff. So it found 102 hosts. Okay, it's really doing a lot of stuff. We'll see. City College has thousands of employees. It should find a good long list, I guess. All right, so then there's Maltigo. Some people love Maltigo. It's never done me any good at all, but Maltigo is supposed to find connections between companies and people. So you give it something like a email address or a website to start, and then you scan, and it finds everything connected to it. Now, probably one reason I don't like it is because I have these news links. I put up like 10 or 20 news articles a day, and I archive them forever. So when I scan my website, it's connected me everywhere in the whole internet. So it's useless. Um, some, somebody less that isn't involved in like news aggregation would be probably a better target. But you put in, I put in my email address and it finds other email addresses associated with me, like Mailinator, Cloudflare and stuff and Twitter. So anyway, this is, um, you'll see a lot of these paranoid conspiracy theory things about how, you know, the Bush is planned 9-11 with this kind of thing where the head of a company is, of course, related to a relative of some other company and they have the same web server as these people and that proves that it's all a conspiracy. You can go mad this way. But anyway, um, of course you can probably find real 
real conspiracies this way too, and real connections between companies. Um, another thing that works pretty well is to just Google an IP address, and then you'll find all the domains on that IP address. And typically, like um, mal malware IP addresses, hosting like a web a web piece of malware, will have a whole bunch of domain names pointing to the same server. And uh, so you can find other malicious domains that way. All right, then there's port scanning, of course. You can just do netcat to a port. That will connect to the port with a handshake, and if there's a banner, you'll see it. So if it's an email, if you like the vulnerable server you're using in this class is an email server, among other things, and you can connect to it and see it there, you can connect to my server on port 22, and it will show you the banner. So many services are, are simple services. They hand out an automated banner, and you find out what they're running and what version it is. Of course, that is not for any reliable by any means. You can just go to the configuration file for your server and make it say anything for the banner, and it is recommended that you should be removing version numbers and stuff from this, because why help the attackers by telling them exactly what version you're using? But many people don't. And when you see that, that gives you a clue that you've got a, probably a default unpatched vulnerable server, but somebody doesn't really know what they're doing very well. They just installed something in its default configuration. And MAP gives you the option of doing a SIN scan which is the default most people use. You send a SYN, the server sends a SYN act, and then you send it, you don't send the act, instead you send a reset. The point of this is it's faster, in that you have less total traffic, and it is stealthier because you never even complete the handshake, and so typically this kind of connection will not appear in logs. Typically you don't put anything in the log unless somebody did something like try to log in, because if they didn't even get that far, they can't really be doing any harm, so that's just some kind of request that broke because somebody lost their wireless connection or something, and you get thousands of those, and they really don't mean anything. So this is a way to typically avoid being in the log. Um, uh, it, because NMAP is so popular, many IDS and IPS systems are looking for it and will trigger somebody's NMAP scanning us. It's, of course, pretty easy to detect an NMAP scan because a real user trying to connect over like a bad wireless network will try to connect to one server like port 80, and it'll break. And then 10 seconds later, they'll try again and it will connect. That's about all it will be. NMAP will try a thousand ports, port, all these ports you're not using. So anybody sending probes to ports you're not using is obviously an attacker. A normal user is not going to try Telnet if you don't use Telnet and so on. So, yeah, that's all you learn from this is which port is open. You don't even get the banner from this kind of scan. So all it will tell you if the port is open or not. It'll tell you if the port is open. Without if the locking. what's that? Without locking. Without locking in or yet. You say you send a sin. If you get a sin act, the port is open. If you get a reset, the port is closed. If you get no answer at all, it was blocked by a firewall. So those are the three choices: open, closed, and filtered. And that's all you get with this kind of scan. But that's usually all you want at a certain stage. Then you know what services you might want to attack. Typically you then go on to the service scan of NMAP, which will now try to harvest the banner to see if it can find out what version of whatever you're running. All right, and so that's the point. Here's a SYN scan. SYN scan is pretty fast, 40 seconds to scan a thousand ports. And if you do the vulnerable server in this class, of course, it's serving all kinds of things. That's why you're using this particular old machine with all these vulnerable Windows things on it so you can practice hacking into it. Um, the version scanner will then grab the banners. So if you do that, it's gonna take longer, but now it gives you all the information, exactly what product, exactly what version. Those are just banners. Of course, this information is not particularly reliable. It's not deduced from any indirect clues. This is just what it claims to be. So you could totally put up a server which lied about what it was, and it probably wouldn't affect its real functionality because the real software people write to connect to things like SSH server doesn't pay attention to this. Then there's UDP scans. Until a few years ago, everybody thought UDP scans were useless because UDP has no handshake. If you send data like to a DNS resolver, if it's, it doesn't answer. Unless you send a valid request, knowing what protocol it is, then it will give you an answer. So how could you do a scan? Well, what you do, you cannot, if someone, on TCP, a common trick is to move something to another port. So you take your web server on 80 and move it to 8080. Now, if people don't know that, they can't find it. Um, but if they connect and get a banner, then they can quickly term out what it is determine what it is, but in UDP, you get no banner, typically. You get no response at all until you send the right kind of request. So if I move a DNS server to a different port, it's going to be real hard to find. But anyway, what, what UDP scan now does is it tries common UDP ports, and it tries valid queries to those ports, to well-known UDP services like NTP and DNS. So it's not at all as useful as a TCP scan, 
but it can detect some services that are running an expected protocol on an expected port. So that's a useful thing to know. It's slightly better than it used to be. UDP used to be considered totally useless. Now it is a little bit useful to do UDP scan, but it's still kind of slow and TCP is your main vehicle to find vulnerable services. So here it took me 1200 seconds to scan that thing with UDP and it found a few things, but you know, um, open or filtered. This is why it's kind of insane. If you send a UDP request to a server and get no reply, that means either the firewall blocked it or it's open. And their query was not acceptable to give me a really an real answer. The only thing that you know is open is where you can actually send a query which it accepts and replies to. And that means it would have to be the right syntax and everything. So uh, here it got no reply. So it's open or filtered. This is kind of insane because you know open is interesting, filtered is the least interesting. Why would it mix those two together? That's the limitation of scanner. This is why people generally said UDP scans are worthless. But it's remotely possible that some of these might still be listening if you could only better format the query. This is the only one you know is open, NetBIOS, because that's a very standard Microsoft service and it's very easy for Nmap to configure a query it will accept. Anyway, all right, uh, Nmap by default, if you don't tell it what to do, it scans a thousand interesting ports which are determined by scanning the entire internet and finding the most common ports. Uh, in the old days, it used to use ping to find servers, but Microsoft got wise to this and started blocking pings, Windows XP. So almost none of the juicy targets answer pings anymore. So it is actually hard. To, if you say, is it a server on this IP address? And that's all you know. There's actually no easy way to answer that question. So what Nmap does is it tries the 1,000 most common ports. And if none of those answer and pings don't answer, then it says server seems down. And that's, so that's what it does. All right. It calls that a TCP ping, which is kind of a strange slang type misnomer, but that's become the standard terminology for NMAP. Um, and by the way, the version scan could crash your server. It happens to this vulnerable server. Uh, this is why some people say you shouldn't even be scanning us or probing us in any way because you're bringing things down. Some servers are so poorly configured and so fragile that even the most innocent traffic brings them down and then they'll try and blame you for hacking them and stuff. Um, all right. And I thought I'd mention a few of these, although I've got other stuff. Here's stuff I saw I presented at Hope a while ago, um, which might be fun if you look at the old research. Uh, there's a time when I did a lot of uh, analysis of websites at colleges, about 2012, 2013. And so I went to colleges back here, and I found a bunch of ones infected with uh, pharmacy redirectors. Um, I started with Kentucky Wesleyan College. For some reason, I, I found, see, I think it happened to a city college server that it got in, attacked by someone trying to sell drugs, uh, not heroin or anything, selling like Viagra and stuff. There's a whole bunch of these, because apparently, I haven't done it, but apparently if you buy Viagra in America, you have to get a prescription and then it costs a lot, like $20 a pill. So there are people that go online and put up websites. What's that? $50 a pill, man. And this is why we need socialized medicine. Anyway, so up in Canada, so what people do is they put up websites and they tell you we're selling you Canadian drugs for like one dollar a pill. It's all Chinese. Of course, I think everything we're selling also comes from China. So anyway, the um, so they pretend to be Canadian websites. It's really drugs coming from China, and it's all run by Russians. Russians put up the websites and hack into servers to advertise. And many people say this is a benefit to the world. I can buy my drugs much cheaper. Of course, it doesn't go through any quality control or anything. And so there was a huge, there was a guy at a university that wanted to do a research study to buy a bunch of the illegal drugs and then buy the legitimate drugs and test them to see if it was safe. And Pfizer that makes Viagra said, we will fund the study, but you won't be able to publish the results until we audit them first. Because if you find out that the illegal stuff is just as good as the legal stuff, we don't want you publishing that. So the author, he could not do this, could not do the research, and he could not use federal money because it is illegal to use federal money to commit crime. You can't buy illegal products with federal money, not even for research purposes. So there has to date still been no test to see how good that drug is. Anecdotally, many people say, these drugs I get from these online websites are perfectly fine. And it's probably exactly the same stuff. You know, other drugs like heroin, or, I mean, uh, what, fentanyl, the, an opiate and morphine, Half of the drugs made by pharmacy companies vanish. They never get prescribed by doctors officially. They end up sold on the street. The pharmacy company, the drug manufacturers all know that their primary market is illegal exchange of the drugs, and that is where most of it actually goes. So it is a problem, but it is entirely possible these illegal sites, in fact, have drugs just as good as the other stuff, but nobody knows. Of course, it could be 
defective or poisonous, and you wouldn't have anybody to sue or anything if you bought it from some spam advertised Russian website. Uh, there'd be no way to sue. So anyway, I so Kentucky Wesleyan College. If you go there, I just found a site. I think a city college in Hackney had this phrase on it: Viagra Online, 100 milligrams. So I just used Google to search for it, and I found a bunch of colleges: UA.edu, um, HighPoint.edu, a bunch of colleges selling this. I put that in the query. I wanted to know which colleges were distributing illegal Viagra. And I said, that's pretty interesting. So I went to the college. You can go to KentuckyWesleyanCollege.edu on a PHP page and buy Viagra with no prescription. And sure enough, if you click that link, you go there, but you don't end up at the college. You end up at this Elfie Med site. So it's a redirector. And I didn't really understand how this worked, but I observed it. Now, if you actually go to the, if you take the URL from Google, this page.php, page equals 797, and put that in your browser, you get the Kentucky Wesleyan College. So what they've done is an internal student or staff at the college that opens the website and clicks the links and uses the college's search engine will find that their server is working just fine. It's only people that come from Google that go here. Now, why do they do this? This is called reputation theft. At least that's the word I used for it. What they're doing is they're getting this to go up higher in the Google ranks. Google ranks a page higher if it is linked by other pages, and they rank it higher more if it's linked by other reputable pages. So a page like a government agency, a medical agency, a major college is considered reputable. So by putting a redirector on their page, which causes things from here to redirect to them, they appear to be more important and trustworthy, and they move up in Google rankings. This is search engine optimization black hat search engine optimization. And so they're, they're causing this domain to be blamed for distributing this criminal product. And if they serve up malware or something, this domain can end up blacklisted by any virus engines and stuff. But it's not obvious to people at the college using it. It seems to them like their server's working fine and there's no malware on it. So there is malware on their server. Somebody managed to put up some kind of Malware on the server, and my impression was they had to gain root privileges on the server to do this. That's why I got upset. I said, some criminals have got root on your server right now, and you guys are ignoring me, not doing anything about it. And I don't know why all they did was this when they could have totally stolen your credit cards and employee database and everything. But the fact is, this is DPP typically, in, even though in principle, from a technical point of view, this indicates that someone could do anything to your server in practice, it appears to be the case in crime organizations that there's a group of people who do not really want to steal data and credit card numbers. All they want to do is search engine optimization. For some reason, they've chosen to limit the amount of crime they do. So even though they have the ability to do pretty much anything, they settle for just putting up a little PHP redirector and stealing some bandwidth. I guess it's sort of a form of crime where they know they can get away with it or something. I mean, I, I was upset. I said, look, criminals are, in charge, are controlling your server, and I can't even get anybody to care. Because in practice, it is well known that people put pharma redirectors on your server. That's not really a big problem. Would the, would the schools uh, on page that, uh, redirect the, the there? No, it, I, I finally, at this time, I tried to get these people to talk to me and cooperate with me at all these colleges. Nobody would. I wanted to sample. I finally, someone got hacked this way, a couple of people, and they came to me. And I was able to analyze it. There's a PHP redirector on the page which looks at the query, and only if you came from a search engine does it redirect you. So it, it, it is designed carefully to be subtle. This is why, you know, um, there's a time when the internet started when viruses used to pop up boxes and make fun of you. And then they said, nowadays, when you get infected, you will see nothing. Your machine will run normally. Your server will run normally. They're doing something subtle that benefits them, and they don't want you to know. So they don't disrupt your website, stop normal operations. Everything's working fine, and you're also serving crime on the side. So I had great difficulty getting anybody to clean this stuff up. Um, but anyway, it was interesting. And uh, um, all right, and I learned something about it doing all that. Uh, then I found search, some pages that just hand out staff data. Um, so I found uh, 12 of these where you could just get student information and such. Um, and it turned out this there was a whole gang of these that all came from the same vendor. There was a vendor um, called... Uh, Attendance spreadsheets. This was a college vendor that made software for colleges, would let you post attendance, and they were just wide open to the whole world. So I found Cambridge College, Carroll, Endicott College, Florida Southern College, all these colleges had domains. I found all these with Google Dorks. 
that would just serve it up. And so I finally reached Genzabar. That was it. Genzabar makes software for colleges. And I think the product line was defective. And I reached them and they patched the product line. And all the colleges took these, upgraded. They sent out an emergency email. Please update your stuff. We have a security problem. And everybody pretty much patched it except for two colleges that were sticks in the wood and didn't update their stuff. Um, but uh, that was interesting. I found 55 colleges with open SQL injection vulnerabilities. And some of them patched it. A lot of them didn't. Um, uh, WordPress and so on. And I found a bunch of them using plain text logins. Um, and, you know, uh, I notify people about these things. Typically, nobody notices, nobody cares, nobody will do anything. That's typically what you get. And every now and then they say, we're going to sue you, you're a rotten criminal, how dare you. And that happened to me when I uh, found uh, medical data at Louisiana State University. They just had an open server, FTP server, serving up their medical data. And I said, hey, guys, this is not good. I found they had a HIPAA compliance office on campus. So I sent them an email saying, dude, your medical data is just blowing in the wind. And I checked and there are FTP scraping sites. Like, you know, Google records things, there are sites that score up to FTP servers. And two years ago, they made copies of all that medical data. It's out here. So not only are you exposing your patient's records to the world, they have already been stolen two years ago by many people. And you really should do something about this. So I sent an email to their HIPAA compliance office and within five hours, the server was down. And I said, well, that's good. But a month later, they wrote an official legal notice, which said that they'd been breached by me. And I was the breach. And that was the official statement. They didn't say anything about the fact that they'd been breached two years earlier. And that was the official statement was I was the criminal that hacked them. And it took me a while to get that cleaned up. Then a bunch of people started, they wrote an article in a trade journal about how I was a rotten guy hacking websites. And they started complaining to the college that they had to fire me and everything. It was kind of a drag. So anyway, that's the thing about, this is called white hatting telling people they have vulnerabilities when they did not come and pay you for a pen test. It is considered unprofessional and insane and stupid. And because you don't get anything out of it, they don't pay you. They don't thank you. You're lucky if they don't prosecute, you have to have like a screw loose to do this. I do a lot of it, but I cannot recommend it or justify it. It's, it's some kind of unhealthy fixation. I do it to get good homework projects. The only way I get a benefit out of it. Anyway. Um, so I got another bunch of cahoots and then I'm going to tell you my latest continuing of this, further bad habit, telling people about problems when they didn't ask me to tell them. I'm learning gradually how to be more careful about it. And what's happening slowly, like, like water eroding through stone, just people are beginning to realize that when someone comes to you and tells you you have a security problem, you don't just punch them in the face. That is not the best solution. People are beginning to realize we might as well admit we had a problem and fix it. It's like I'm hearing about the Catholic Church just had this big meeting. You know, there was an official statement from the 1960s, from the Pope saying, if any priest has been abusing someone, you will totally hush it up, conceal it from everyone, handle it in secrecy. No one will ever know this idiot is self a secret. Our official policy is hide, hide, hide everything. And they're just beginning to realize that's not a good policy anymore. And companies are beginning to realize, you know, if you have a security problem, you can't just shoot everyone that told us about it and pretend nothing's wrong. Actually admitting you had a problem and fixing it is probably the best move, but it's, it's a slow cultural shift. You know, anyway, um, all right. I got cahoots someplace. All right. All right, let's do some of these. Yeah, I think that when the US military ran a bug bounty about two years ago, that really began to melt the ice here a bit. More and more people are realizing it's okay to admit you have problems. If even the US military will admit they have problems and they have to fix them, I think only the banks are still having their head in the sand and pretending they have no problems. And we'll talk more about that later. I'm, I'm back in the financial industry, so we'll see how they respond to these latest blatch. But I we exposed a bunch of bank vulnerabilities about three years ago. They all just stonewalled me. No, we have no problem. Shut up. Get lost. We have no one to talk to. Take a hike. Because I think they all believe that their customers and investors and regulatory agencies all believe that there are no flaws. And they're trying to maintain that image at all costs. But at some point, they'll have to admit everybody on the internet has just an endless series of flaws and patches. That's all anybody can do. And you might as well get over yourself and admit that you're the same as everybody else. Apple did this until about four years ago. Apple's official position was you have no viruses, no malware, no security problems. They held on to that as long as they could until they had to admit they're the same as everybody else. Anyway. All right, I'll give it another five seconds. All right. All 
All right, how do you get to one port? <laughs> All right, netcat makes the connection to one port. All right, and how do you find all open ports? And map, of course. All right. Which one finds email addresses? Okay, that's the harvester. And by the way, let's see how it worked. It's done. So uh, I wonder how many it found. Um, is it going to tell me? I thought it might put them in a file or something. Here it found a bunch of servers. I thought it would find email addresses, but um, I'm not getting much of a clear answer here for how many email addresses it found. Uh, there we are. No emails found. What? Hosts found in search engine. Well, that's not right. <laughs> I could find email addresses. Well, I'm not very impressed by that tool. Maybe it's getting blocked by the campus firewall or something. That's a pretty pathetic result. I expected it to find thousands of email addresses. I don't know, man. What's that? I know, but we, we have a staff page that lists email addresses. You should at least scrape that. I don't know, man. Either the harvester's not working very well, or I need to have different options or something. But that's pretty pathetic. I could have got that with dig any. Anyway, so it should have done better than that, in my opinion. I think maybe that tool has not been updated, and people have changed their policies, so it's a little bit harder to find them. Anyway, all right, so which switch will find DNS servers? All right, SU does UDP scans and that'll find DNS servers. Which one is often blocked? Okay, and map, of course, easy to detect unless you turn on some stealth modes, and even then, still pretty easy. So people often do detect it and block it. So I'm going to record the winners, and then I'm going to show you a few things that are still in the process of being disclosed, and therefore a little um, concealed at the moment. All right, so um, here we are down at the bottom. There's my winners. Okay, so M dot twice. And Anton twice, and Ray. All right, we still have a real name, so I think we're good. All right, so I'm going to stop the online sharing. Let's see if I've got any more chat messages coming in. Yeah, Ray, good, thanks. Ray gave me a last name, which is good. Okay, and um, all right, so I'm going to stop the share unless there are any more questions. I'll wait a few seconds, and then I'll... Um, See if anybody wants to work in the lab, and then I'm going to drive down to San Jose and see what's happening. There's a contest underway, a brand new one. We're in the first Mayor's Cup or something. We're one of the first few people competing in the very first event. Liz is down there with the team doing it right now, and it goes on till like 3 p.m., so I should be able to see some of it and meet the people. I know the people running it. They're very good. Um, yeah. It's actually defense and attack, and a lot of it is preparing reports and submitting a uh, giving talks to management, explaining what you found. So it's very good stuff, very relevant to real security work. So, uh, and it's also run by um, some people I really like. Um, so I think, I expect very good things to come from it. And, and so this is, that's where a lot of people are. Liz is down there with the team doing it. And I will go there and see what's happening after I'm done here. So they're suffering productively. Oh, good. Oh, Elizabeth is here. Or somebody's here. Elizabeth, no, oh, she's on. I didn't know that. Good. She says they're suffering. Good. Okay. Hi, Liz. I'm glad you, uh, somehow the people went to your server and somehow they got redirected back here. I'm glad that happened. It occurred to me after I started that I forgot to tell people what link to use. Anyway, they've, some people seem to make it. All right, so I'm stopping the share and then I'm gonna tell you some secret stuff. All right.